yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talking Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talking they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. So we brought another good one in. Wilton Jackson uh, is in the house in terms of giving us a update. With that being said, welcome to episode 533 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast with the show that covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kabil, along with my co-host, Wilton Jackson and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to Casey Wage 1230. AM Studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper in a beautiful home at Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, let me make sure I get this straight. Wilton Jackson, the second, <laughs> the <laughs> second, I need to make sure y'all understand, we have the second in the house. With that being said, Charles, if you allow me to go to Wilton and just ask him as a guest, and I don't know, he's been on here regular quite a bit, certainly when you were in charge, and now even coming in off the bench uh, with me, I recognize his talent. And when I need that sixth, seventh man, and we start doing those presses, bringing Wilton in is always a nice luxury to have. Obviously, AD is always special. So, man, I, I'm getting me a nice little squad put together, Charles. <laughs> we going to be dangerous, man. We yes, indeed. All hands on deck, man. We, we got – we got some fire here, man. Hey, it's up. like it's like bringing that three point shooter uh, uh, off the bench. That that six man, man, he comes in fire. So uh, great addition to the team as well. Yeah, you talking about the Olympics, men's and women's basketball? She, we might have us a goal coming in a little bit too. <laughs> how about that, <laughs> Wilson? How you doing today? I'm doing good, Doctor Kavir. Glad to be here. Glad you're having me on again. With that being said. Uh, Today's episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency, LLC. THG Agency, a company that provides sporting and educational and educational consulting and data analytics, I should say. With that being said, Charles, how are you doing today? Doing well, Doc. Had an opportunity to go out and catch a little bit of uh, Texas Southern's uh, practice the past couple of days. And, you know, it's, it's a very interesting part of camp. Where you kind of you're after that first scrimmage and uh, you kind of in that grind part of camp now. So uh, guys are really getting after it, and now you're starting to see depth charts kind of starting to uh, get filled out and things of that nature. So uh, it's hey, well, very Coach interesting. Chris, this kind of stuff and watch. Now that you've had an opportunity to kind of. Uh... Your little production, Sorry, man. Right there. Oh, he's like he's out there. <laughs> Look at that, he was sweating out there. Got a chance to talk to him a little bit. But, yeah, we uh getting into that uh, dog days of camp, if you will. Yeah. We got a little bit of that camp. We'll get into that uh, thing, and we might even have a little bit of uh, Jackson State uh, coach TD uh, in terms of getting a little bit into that. With that being said, let me go to you uh, on this news, Charles, sticking with you. What, what a, What's some news of the day? Uh, before I do that, I guess I need to stay in front of this. I'll do that. Uh, FAMU interim president asked for leadership, team resignation. This came from HBCU game day. We heard this in the blogs, um, social media pl platform out there. 
I was fascinating with this news just from so many different frameworks and hopefully at the latter part of the show, maybe the last segment, we'll get a chance to step in this a little deeper. But obviously by now, everybody's kind of heard the news that follow HBCU at any level. The new Florida A&M interim president, Dr. Timothy Beard, is wasting no time in making changes at FAMU, and he isn't starting small. According to the documents acquired by HBCU Game Day, Beard has asked for the immediate resignation of members of the FAMU senior leadership team by the end of today. Uh, the Florida A&M University senior leadership team of the university includes, according to this document, the chief operating officer, the provost, general counsel, athletic director, chief of staff, communication doctor, uh, director, and several other key cabinet positions. I would imagine it means VP of student uh, services, uh, certainly affairs, which is amazing to me because it's my understanding school starts next week or the week after that. I think it's next week. And you slated to begin the fall semester next week and plays this week zero football game against MEAC SWAC Challenge in Atlanta next week against Norfolk State. The letter was formed, letter, and was accompanied by suggested response form seeming to expedite the response. Um, so while this is a good point that the HBC game they put in there, I think a lot of people uh, are not familiar with higher education. It states that while it's not uncommon for interim presidents to make changes, certainly a sweeping change of a senior leadership uh, it's just days before the start of the fall semester. It's curious timing. And critical decisions for the successful school year are made during the time based on the factors of enrollment and other uh, components with that being said. So, like I said, we'll get in discussion, maybe get your thoughts on that, particularly how this affects sports. For me, it goes way different than that in terms of the academics when you talk about the provost as well. A lot of things going on. It would be amazing to kind of see how this goes forward. Uh, with that being said, Charles, do you have any other news that you wanted to get into before we get into the poll rank? Well, yeah. The final seven, Charles. Major the division. Seven. seven is coming up today. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. And the Team USA Sprinter with HBCU ties wins Olympic gold in the women's 4 by 400 meter relay. Uh, this comes to us from uh, HBCUsports.com on the final day of track and field at the 2024 Summer Olympics. Former Livingstone track and field athlete, Kenyara Hayes won gold as part of the American women's 4x400 relay team. In the first round of the 4x400 relay heats, Hayes clocked a 51.27 split on the first leg. The team finished with a time of 321.44 to win their heat and advance to the final. And in the final, Team USA cruised to victory, setting an American record with a time of 315.27.27. 1-0 seconds off the world record to claim gold. So kudos goes out to Kenira Hayes uh, with the HBCU ties winning gold at the uh, 2024 Summer Olympics. Olympics, big deal, big deal when you get in there. You get a gold, man. And America's did pretty well. Won overall medals and tied China for golds, and they actually came down to that uh, women's championship game that was really close because yeah. I'm sure that if uh, you're a sports fan, you follow pretty closely. And if you didn't see it live, you certainly heard about it in regards to only a foot on the line uh, made sure that it didn't go to overtime in that uh, U.S. and the women were able to get their eighth consecutive gold medal, which means there was a tie for overall gold medal at 40 and 40. What you got, got Charles? And, Doc, we just got to mention it real quick. I mean, Steph Curry exploding. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, the way he uh, exploded there uh, in the like final it? two minutes of that game. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's I was what, to the TV. That's what you call vintage Steph Curry. This is what we have been watching the last decade. Like, that very, that last three-point shot that – it's like you were sitting there. You you thought to yourself, like Steph, what are you doing for real? Like, are you really throwing this shot up? But if you watch, if you watched him closely, you knew, like, okay, this is probably gonna go in. It's going up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> great point. Great points there. Before I ask you for an update on whatever news that you wanted to share, Wilton, I I, I do want to say, uh, in regards to what that looks like. It's really exciting 
because over the years I've become more fan of players than maybe teams. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I kind of have the team I grew up with, which happens to be the Lakers. Um, from that perspective, but to find an opportunity where you could just cheer for Steph, particularly when you look at those three KD, LeBron, and cheer them on as a team was fascinating. When you really recognize the greatness of those players and them coming together to get it done was amazing. And then you had some of the young guns uh, getting it done as well. Well, with Booker and uh, it, it's fascinating to see what that looks like. Back to some HBCU thoughts. Wilton, what's on your mind? Well, like Charles kind of mentioned, I mean, it's that time of the year. You know, camps are getting, you know, those those dog days like he mentioned. I was at Jackson State's press conference uh, on Monday, and, you know, Coach Taylor was saying to himself, like, the players, are, they're tired of looking at each other. They've been going at camp for, like, maybe two or three weeks now. And, you know, if I'm a football player, even aside from Jackson State, if, I, if I'm sitting here looking at my teammate for the last three weeks, I'm, I'm like, man, I'm tired of sitting by you. I'm tired of smelling you. I'm tired of – I'm just tired of looking at you. I need to hit somebody <laughs> else besides you. I need an opponent to take my frustration. Now, I mean, I'm already in here lifting weights. You know, I'm going to, you know, uh, extra sessions. I'm dealing with coaches in my ear talking about I did something wrong in a drill. I need something else. I need my opponent. And it's just, and it's honestly, that's just what it comes down to. It's these last couple of weeks, but I'm hoping that for every team amongst HBCU ranks and just college football period, that they're literally every player is taking this time to really, really hone in on the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Because as how many times do we see in the beginning of the season where teams have jailed throughout the summer, but it's nothing like real time in, in, in football games. And when when it's on the line, when the clock is started, you got to get that first down, or you got to make plays to win games. This is the time. This is why you were going through all those drills and all those moments during practice, and this is where it counts now. Great point. And um, we're just a little over a week or so away from things really getting started with the toe meeting level. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into the video, Charles, if you would, in terms of Texas Southern's uh, football coach, Coach Disman. Uh, being at practice that we kind of snuck at. Let's go ahead and play it in full, and then you can provide some additional content. No doubt. It's the film from Saturday. Uh, what are your observations I post uh, for scrimmage? Uh, Saturday was very good. Today's practice was very lackadaisical. I think we had too much success on Saturday. Everyone thought we won the uh, SWAC already. So we got to get these guys to realize that every day you got to come to work. Every day you got to come to work with your hard hat up and ready to work. Today was very lackadaisical. Had too many penalties, too many jump off sides, people holding, missed kicks, dropped balls. It's just very lackadaisical. So it's on the guys, it's not on the coaches. I'm putting all this pressure on the guys. It's not pressure, it's expectations. I expect them to come out and do a lot better than what they did. Today was a very shitty day for us. With regards to the expectations, uh, we take a look at this part uh, within camp. Is it normally a grind around this part of camp? Uh, as any camp, guys who play on Sunday is grinding. Guys who play on Saturday got to grind. You got to grind if that's what you want to do. They chose this job. I'm asking them to do their job. That's the only thing I'm asking. I'm not asking them to be superheroes. I'm asking them to just do their job. Sure thing. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> he kept it real. Hey. <laughs> hey, y'all. You get some good footage, man. You got him. I mean, he looked fine. He looked frustrated. Like, man, what did I sign up for? And, 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 you know, Doc, it's very interesting because I, I, I like showing up at, at, at camp around this time, uh, mm-hmm. especially after that first scrimmage, because you and, and people sometimes present this, you know, glorious, uh, yo, yeah, great camp. Blah, 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 blah. But the reality of it is there are some good days and there are some down days. Mm-hmm. And this this past uh, day was a down day. So everything is not. You know, this thing, this crescendo going up, you're going to have ebb and flows. And then I think that was a very real portrait of what, what camp really is uh, for, for all these teams uh, coming into the season. Man, I love you bringing that perspective like that. It's really some great insight, giving people a chance to kind of get behind the scene and see uh, what's taking place as so many people do not get that opportunity. So the fact that you were able to get out there and share that, I appreciate it. Stick with us. We'll be back after our first break. We'll come back on the other side, and it's time to unveil of the top 21, the final 17s, that top 17s of Dr. Ville's 2024 preseason poll ranking. 
and we'll remind you of the overall 21 uh, after we get these guys to tell me what they think of this top seven. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? <laughs> oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one, too. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927 7794. And oh, yeah, tell them Sonya sent you. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're gonna tell you if your team, if they want a lot of and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention because he's gonna teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. With inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Let's get into this power ranking. We're going to start with the bottom seven of the top seven. <laughs> Starting <laughs> out with none other than <laughs> South Carolina State Bulldogs. They're in the top seven. New coach coming over from Benedict. No introduction needs to be <laughs> they finished five and six last year, three and two, a lot of transfers, a lot of talent. Uh, will they be ready? Can they take that next step? I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Chinnis Barry, little magic, 157 points, finds his way in the top seven. I'd like to see if the guys agree with this. Check this out. At number six, staying in the MEAC. 
The MIAC is hot and heavy. Is all the talent in the <laughs> MIAC now? Lashes, swag, swept it. MIAC challenge. Got it done at the end of the year. Finally bringing home the celebration vote with FAMU. Well, the first two in the top seven are coming out of the MIAC. Morgan State Bears, four and six last year. Three and two in terms of what they did in conference play. Coming down with a chance to at least have a share of the crown. I know they don't recognize it. Uh, in the MIAC in terms of the regular season. They find a way to only give it to whoever wins the tiebreaker if there is a tie. But that's Damon Wilson. 160 point, 166 points. He comes in at number six. Well, at number five, we're going to go back down to the south, if you would, a little deeper south. We're going to go into the south in terms of the Southwest Athletic Conference, and we have none other than Alabama State Hornets. Eddie Rob. Charles, you know a little something about Eddie. He, he said he used to ride the bike with you. He oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He wanted me to let you know. Around you. I don't let know me tell you he something. He claimed something different. Coach Robinson knows every bike route around here in Houston. I, every bike route. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told me. That's what he Man. told me. Man. Seven and four overall, five and three. They took the next step. They beat Alabama AM Bulldogs. In the Magic City Classic, got a couple of other big wins down there, but uh, finished five and three with 177 points. Uh, they are not ranked. They got a transfer quarterback that came over to Texas Southern. A lot of people are interested, and he got a couple of other transfers. So they say there's a quarterback battle. Maybe not, depending on who you believe. Andrew Body. Many people believe at the end of the day he will be the starter, and they got a matchup as they will be playing in the Orange Blossom Classic. But they have won first place vote uh, in terms of coming in at number five. Bringing us to number four, we're going to go back to the MIAC. That's three. That's three of the top seven coming out of the MIAC. They said MIAC wasn't playing no football no more. Well, mm. according to these numbers, I don't know, but the Howard Bison that played in the, the Miag Sweat, I mean, played in the Celebration Bowl with a chance to play for a championship. And they played against FAMU, really close game, entertaining, had the game lead late in that game, but could not get it done after winning the Miag, after dethroning North Carolina Central. That was a top 10 team in the FCS poll ranking, number one and two in many people's HBCU poll at the time. But they finished the season last year at 6-6, six 4-1 and six, four and one in the conference. They have one first place vote with 181 points. So seven is South Carolina State Bulldogs. And number six is Morgan State Bears. And number five, Alabama State Hornets. And number four, uh, Howard Bison. In terms of those Bisons, they are led by Larry Scott. Whew. Charles, let me know your thoughts in terms of this bottom four of the top seven. What are let's, your yeah, let's take a look at it because I believe seven, six, five, and four, seven, six, five. We know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they will have some of the most formidable defenses in all of HBCU football. Mm. Uh, South Carolina State bringing 15 guys back with a uh, starting experience, Aaron Smith, linebacker, uh, potential Sunday guy. Uh, but the question mark, for South Carolina State, Morgan State, and Alabama State, obviously, is at the quarterback position. Uh, when you take a look at South Carolina State, we can you can make an honest argument that the quarterback position held them back last year. Uh, we all saw that in the, in the MIAC SWAC Challenge. Uh, Morgan State, same thing. Defensively, they will beat you up. Very physical team. Uh, Ty Smith is, re, uh, is coming back uh, for Morgan State, but can they do anything offensively? I think, I think that's the, the million-dollar question with regards to Morgan State. Same thing with Alabama State. Will Andrew Body actually be the star? I think mean, you, you hear some rumblings uh, out of Montgomery that it's not a foregone conclusion that he will be the number one QB. So I, I think those are question marks around those teams. My question is, Howard arguably has the best one-two running back uh, punch in HBCU football when you talk about Eden James and Jared Hunter. Again, question marks 
at quarterback position. Who will be play quarterback? Quinn Williams gone. But for me, with the amount of firepower and the offensive line that we saw last year with Howard, I see them up a little higher. Hmm. Fascinating. Good point. Woo! Charles got a challenge already out there, Will. <laughs> Jackson in the second. What do you think about these first four in this top seven? Oh boy, 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 boy. I don't, I don't, I don't dislike the list. I will say this. Uh I maybe would have switched. I hope that you team. don't dislike it. I would have. I, 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 I will say this though. I think I maybe this. I might get a lot of flack for this, but I might have would have switched South Carolina State with Prairie View. I know Prairie View was at eight. Huh. I maybe. Mm. I maybe would have put Prairie View. I think you can make that argument, and I think you said South that last week that you thought Prairie View could drop in that top seven. No, exactly. I, I think South Carolina State could be number eight. However, I do think with a coach like Chinnis Beer and obviously the players that they that that he's brought in and that they have returning, uh, I think they're going to be okay. I'm not mad. I'm not like I said. I'm not mad at that spot. Morgan State again. Sim- simply, you know, simply put, what Charles said. I know that defense is going to be lights out. It really comes down to who's going to be their quarterback and can that particular quarterback that they choose under Damon Wilson can he be consistent and move the ball down the field essentially. Uh, I, you know, with Alabama State, I, I'm, I'm ready to see Andrew Body do what Andrew Body does when Andrew Body is healthy. Mm. And if Andrew Body is not healthy, we not we won't see a consistency on offense uh, per se if he's a starter. Because like I said, we all have heard those rumblings if he's gonna be whether or not he's gonna be <laughs> quarterback. So those rumblings do exist. Uh, Howard, you know. Uh, Quarterback play, obviously, that, that becomes a thing depending on who they start at quarterback, but their running game is is lethal. Um, and if it if they look anything like they did last year, um, you could probably see them being where they are and or potentially being higher. Ooh, man, hot takes. Y'all said these folks, some of these folks might be a little too low. I like the way you think in terms of Lee saying that I might have got it right in the top seven. Outside of prayer, if you and Bubba – McDowell, what I'm hearing in camp, uh, the question mark coming in was quarterback. That may not be a problem. So we'll see oh, uh, if that holds true. We'll find out pretty quick. Labor Day weekend, uh, if that is the case, it should be fun. But with that being said, stick with us after we take our next break. We'll come back and give you the top three. Ooh. Perennial three. When out. we talk about Olympics, kind of playing. I know it's over, but it's only three that get on the stand. That is the bronze, the silver, and the gold. So we're going to give you that top three when we come back after this break. We'll see what these gentlemen say in terms of things moving forward. If you paid attention for the last couple of weeks, you know who the top three are just from process elimination. But what you don't know, who, what, what spot will be these top three teams We'll see what that looks like. Stick with us. We'll come back right after break, and we'll break it down and give it to you and see what these gentlemen think uh, of my if top you think three. All and who are gets exact- the point. If you think Going all pads in- are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. And who the ball? Who the ball? 
So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, And pay attention boy. Cause he gonna teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Gavilles inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Let's get into this top three. Oh, my goodness. Do we have a little bit of fun? Can we get some swack attention? <laughs> Maybe so. Let's get into the swack. D.C. Taylor, Jackson State is in the house. D. Jackson State, pregame, 1400 Street. You know, y'all got so many names. I forget them all. I don't know which one to use, but I know one. T.C. Taylor, second year, is at the helm. Well, I just put a little pressure, additional pressure on it. They say all the talent is in the East. Well, it seems like it may still be in the East. Mm. Jackson State at number three. They finished last year 7-4, 5-3. and four, five and three. Have one first place vote, 203 points. I'm fascinated to see what these Tigers are going to do. Well, they, they get a little idea. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. That is number three. Bringing us to number two. Florida a and Rattlers, 12-1 and last year, 8-0 and in conference play, three first-place votes, defending Dr. Ville's inside the HBC Sports Lab, pretty much consensus champions of 2023 with 218 points. They are at number two coming out of the SWAC. That means three of your top seven are not only out of the SWAC, they are in the Eastern Division. So it may be hard to find a way to stay in the top seven since they haven't played each other, or maybe they'll just knock everybody else around and stick right there. But that'll be fascinating. We also have three in the MIAC. Well, you find out it's actually four. North Carolina Central Eagles finished last year at nine and three, four and one. Uh, they have 220 points, five first place votes. So getting two more first place votes than Florida AM. Uh, just edging them out in terms of total points by two. Uh, this also means that in the Orange Blossom Classic, you'll get a top five matchup. In terms of Dr. Cavill's poll rankings, you'll have number five coming out of the squat, Eastern Division, Alabama State Hornets. And you'll have the number one North Carolina Central Eagles putting it online the very first week. Boy, you talking about a match, matchup between me Ack, and Swack. You also have the number two team in my ranking playing the MEAC Swack Challenge. The opening, they, they played Norfolk State, which is in the top <clears> 20. <throat> so it'll be fascinating to see what that looks like. Obviously, I started with you, Charles. So I'm going to go to Wilton now. Give his thoughts and save your final top three for last. Charles, I set you up a little bit with Jackson State being the top three. I put that monkey squarely on your back. <laughs> Wilton, I know you like that as well. <laughs> All that love y'all got for Jackson, I mean for Southern, but now you got to deal with the punishment. I got Jackson in top three. Do you like it? Are you comfortable with Jackson State being in three, fam? You in two, North Carolina Central one? You got an argument? You want to see something else? Tell me how you feel about the top three here. I like the top three. I don't necessarily know if it's fully correct right now. I say mm -hmm. that because what? You remember, you remember when I said last week on the show, I said the champions – I feel like should always be at the top coming in. So obviously, well, I know Fam U is there, but I also remember you remember last year how Alabama State beat Jackson State. So, and also we know who the favorite is out of the Swag East right now coming into the season, mm -hmm. it, out of the Swag East specifically. So, do I think that on today, August thirteenth, uh, is Jackson State going to beat Alabama State? I don't know. I think it's going to be a good game. I think it's going to mm -hmm. be a great game, actually. And I say that the because game is in uh, Montgomery. Yes, yeah, it's in Montgomery. Montgomery. Oh, it's in Montgomery. And not only is that game in Montgomery, but I want to. I'm going I'm to take a note out of Charles' book. That game when they play Alabama State, that's after Mississippi Valley. That's in November. It's a mm -hmm. road game, and they play Alcorn the following week. There you go. Ooh, yeah, and you I'm go. just like, that's going to be a tough, tough, tough stretch. Yeah. Real yeah, tough. What do you think? See, you're bringing in the schedule. That's when I know that y'all experts and y'all ready for the football season. Y'all look at players. Y'all look at talent. Y'all look when the game is played, where the game is played. 
what games are played before it in terms of what it looks like from a scheduling perspective. That's a lot of great analysis, Will. I really appreciate what you did there. And not only that, I want to make this point, too. As far as talent-wise, I think Jackson has plenty of talent. Uh, you know, obviously, having talked to, to Coach Taylor, uh, his press conference on Monday, uh, Jacoby and Morgan, obviously, was the starter last year throughout the middle middle portion of the season until the end. Um, but there are some rumblings there that potentially he, you know, I won't necessarily say he won't be the starter, but at the same time, there's some competition there. Uh, the running backs room there is, is going to probably be phenomenal again. Irv Mulligan will be back. J.D. Martin will be back. Uh, you know, from what I what we've been told from Coach Taylor, offensive line, defensive line has been beefed up some. So that'll be interesting there. Uh, with FAMU, we know the talent is there, but with everything we're, that's that's going on, which I know we'll talk about in that last segment, I'm, I'm wondering will that play a part in this team in the focus? You know, with the, with with the program, I don't think that you know they lack the talent. I'm just wondering will that will that level of focus still be there with everything going on with the university? Uh, oh, no. With North Carolina Central, uh, we, we know what, what what the program brings. Obviously, they get Jamari Taylor back. Uh, no more Mookie Collier. You know, he's gone. But uh, interested to see what they look like coming into this upcoming season. Mm. Great breakdown. Great breakdown. I like the way you did the tease coming out of the break. We'll get to listen to uh, T.C. Taylor a little bit during that interview session that you had and the questions that you broke down. So I'm excited about that give some people some more insight. But with that being said, Charles, obviously we talked about T.C. Taylor. At number two, you have James Cozy. The third, his inaugural season uh, coming in, he'll have an interim athletic director, an interim president, an interim provost in terms of the academic side of the house. So it's going to be fascinating with all that newness, you know, can he still push forward? Because we know there's a lot of talent there. Sure. I don't think the talent is going to be the issue. Can you get them to jail? Can you get them to stay hungry? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Can you get the new guys to buy in in terms of what it means to be a rattler? We talk about that uh, with some of these blue blood programs, if you would allow me, or the branded programs I like to talk about, the HBCU. Uh, and then you have number one on the Trey Oliver. So it's fascinating to see what that looks like. Let me know what are your thoughts on my top three here? Well, I, I think when you take a look at Jackson State, undoubtedly, I think they're a very talented team. But Alabama State can point to the scoreboard uh, uh, against Jackson State. And I, I think that's something that I keep in mind I, right now as where I would start the season. I would probably swap them uh, uh, within the top five. Uh, I think just as I talked about uh, uh, Howard with a dynamic one-two punch in the backfield, I don't think there's a deeper running back room in HBCU football than Jackson State. The question becomes, can Jackson State's passing game balance things out? And I think that's the question that surrounds uh, Jackson State's quarterback. Uh, uh, can he put some pressure on defenses uh, downfield to where it opens up those running backs? And they have a bevy of running backs and – you know, when you talk about Irv Mulligan, uh, prior to him getting hurt last year, probably I would think just the, the best running back in HBCU football. But you add, uh, you mentioned J.D. Martin. You, you talk about uh, Ahmad Miller, another hard running back that can run in between the tackles, bounce it outside with speed. Uh, they have a deep running back room. The question becomes for Jackson State, can that passing game, can it do enough to open things up with regards to the running game? And uh, I think TC talked about it. I listened to his presser, uh, how deep they are on, on the offensive line and defensive line. So uh, are they physical? And I think one of the hallmarks of Jackson State football is a physical offensive line to go with that running game. So those are things I'm going to be keeping in mind when you take a look at Jackson State. Florida a &M, I have no problem with them being number two, but let me back into this the way Florida a &M, uh the pundits sort of, told me last year, there is no way you can lose that amount of talent and the head coach and just expect to reload and be right back in the thick of things. Listen, I think that they're as talented as a bunch uh, as any team out there, and you saw what they were able to go out and go do on the recruiting trail. But we said the same thing about Jackson State last year. Mm -hmm. So I think it's I think it's going to be um, – uh, I think it's going to be a, a tough go for family. I'm not saying that they're not going to – be you know they're not going to cause some headaches for teams, but to go twelve and one again, I, that's that's asking a bit much. Uh, but I, I but I'm looking forward to seeing 
what sort of Florida a and team that we're going to see this upcoming year. I think there'll be some more headaches uh, along the way, some a bumpy road. Uh, take a look at North Carolina Central, and I say this with the utmost regard for Trey Oliver. Uh, Davis Richard is not in the building. Uh, you know, I think that's huge. Uh, and I, I'm probably I'm going to need Josh Sims, Captain Eagle himself, to kind of explain to me why everybody is very, very high on North Carolina Central. But the question for me is, Davis Richard, those type quarterbacks come once every 10 years. I mean, I'm just I, I mean, do you remember who the quarterback was after Steve McNair? Do you remember who the quarterback was after Devontae Kincaid? You know, not not too many people remember Norris Brown who follows Steve McNair. Not too many people remember Jeremy Hickbottom, who followed Devontae Kincaid. That's a, a tall task for Walker Harris. Uh, but I, I think, you know, they, they bring back quite a few pieces, but uh, I don't know if I'm ready to stamp them as the elite of the MIG. I still think you have to go through the Howard Bison. I, w- I don't have a problem with you saying that they have to go through Howard Bison and certainly understand your quest- your concerns on the Eagles, particularly when you have really a generational quarterback that came through. Um, my thing that I think you also can't look at that in a vacuum, to your point, which in a lot of ways is the fact, what does everybody else have coming back? Mm-hmm. Sure. And sure. so I think that's part of it. If you had other teams – that had quarterbacks coming back like last year, I think you probably wouldn't see Central as high. Um, I think part of this is the coach. People are familiar with him. He's become sure. the sure package. He's okay. done it a little bit before Davis and really shot out the gate when he got Davis in his junior year. And then last year he succeeded with him in terms of senior year. So I think that's part of it. But I don't know if there's the – probably some people would argue – the quarterback that has the most time out there in a system is Walker at North Carolina Central. He played one full game. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. it was against Valley and nobody saw it. It probably hurts there. But he got a lot of time in a lot of those games because most teams, they were beat, beating teams up. So he played quite a bit of ball. Um, and he played in some meaningful games in terms of the playoffs. You don't get much meaningful than that in the second half in terms of what that looks like. So he's played some games. So I think that's one of the things people are comfortable saying, at least he's been in the action. Everybody mm-hmm. else kind of wait to see who that, who that quarterback is. We had a lot of folks coming into the season thinking one quarterback, and we already hearing in camp that there's a second quarterback pushing him. Now, what is mm-hmm. that camp talk that you uh, discussed earlier and putting out there? I think it's fascinating. But I think some of this is not so much about people's confidence in North Carolina Central, but it's confidence in the coach and their concerns with everybody else. Yeah, sure. To your point, and not having as much confidence. And I think that kind of goes when you broke down and saw all the people that got a first place vote. You literally had five teams that got a first place vote. We haven't seen that over the last two years. Yeah. Two, maybe three teams that got a first place vote. We yeah. got five teams. And even the separation between one and two is five and three. And to your point, uh, even with Fam U, that you know you have a lot of talent, there's still questioning in terms of can Cozy. Con- the the continuity. Coach, can yep. he push through? Can he get past of being, you know, a first year coach at FAMU? Obviously, he has other head coaching experience. So I'm fascinated to see what that looks like. And I think that was an indication when you think about the predicted order of finishes. I remind everybody in the MIAC was Delaware State 22, Norfolk State with one first place vote, South Carolina State with two first place votes, 78 point 50 respectively, Morgan State with one first place vote with 80 points. Howard with a four first place vote at 92. North Carolina Central with four first place votes. So you had two teams with first place votes with 110 points. So that gives you some indication if you look back that even the coaches and SIDs are not that confident in who they're saying won. It's really jumbled up and close. Let me take you to the SWAC. SWAC West. People kind of got surprised in terms of who's won, but if you look closer at it, you had six, Texas Southern at 40, Arkansas Pine Bluff at 61, Southern with 70 points with one first place vote, Grambling third with 72 points with four first place votes, Prairie View uh, number two 
104 points with eight first place votes. Alcorn with 112 points and 11 first place votes. It's only three first place votes difference. Yeah. So it's not a lot of difference when you start talking about that one, two, and some people even slip to three and four uh, with five, four teams getting a first place vote. You go to the East Division, we talked about three teams in the top seven in my ranking. But look what they have here. Mississippi Valley State with 31 points. Somebody even gave them a first place vote. We'll discuss that later. But Thune Cookman with 47 points. Alabama AM, 76 with four first place votes. Jackson State, 87 points total with two first place votes. Florida AM, 104 with six first place votes. And Alabama State, 114 with 11 first place votes. A little more difference there in terms of first and second. But if you look at second, third, and fourth, that's actually 12 first place votes outside of the number one team. Mm -hmm. So the separation there is not quite as big as it's seen. Let me give some love in terms of Tennessee State. They were picked fourth in terms of the OVC Big South partnership they have. And then when you talk about the Colonial, you have North Carolina and T in a 16 member league. They came in fourth team in terms of what their expectation there in Hampton came in 12th, uh, where you see them outside of that. So as we close this segment, getting the next one, let me say this. Then 21 was Delaware State Hornets out of the MEAC. And number 20 was North Carolina a t Aggies out of the Colonial. The CAA, I know it's coastal now, 1 in 10 last year. 19 was Mississippi Valley State Delta Devils out of the SWAC, 1 in 10 last year overall. At number 18, Arkansas Pine Bluff, 2 and 9. Out of the SWAT at 17 is Texas Southern Tigers, three and eight out of the SWAT. Number 16 is Hampton Pirates out of the CIA, five and six. Um, I did talk about Walker, but a lot of folks um, are looking at Hampton in terms of their quarterback play, maybe being the best HBCU. So it's fascinating mm -hmm. to see what that looks like. Getting in the top 15, and number 15 is Southern Jaguars, six and five. Y'all thought that was too low. We'll see if that resonates later. And number 14, Bethune Cookman Wildcats, three and eight. 13 is Norfolk State Spartans, 3-8. and eight. They were picked five, right? A lot of people are saying, hold on. And that's going to be fascinating in terms of that MEAC SWAC challenge. Can they make a statement and shock the world? We'll see what that means. At number 12, Grambling State Tigers, 5-6. and six. At number 11, Tennessee State Tigers, can they get over the hump? Pass just having a winning season. Can they do some damage in OVC? I'm interested, obviously, in that Pine Bluff versus Tennessee State. Southern Heritage Classic matchup. That was a close game last year. Can Pine Bluff shock the world and really put a dent in what the Tennessee State Tigers want to do? Um, number 10, Alcorn State Braves predicted to win the West. Number 9, Alabama A&M Bulldogs 5-6. and six. People are questioning, are they going to take the next step? Are they for play? Are they for real? Uh, ask, interesting there. And number 8, Prairie View A&M Panthers. Some people think they're too low. 6-6, six 6-2. and, six, six and two. I think uh, – Raymond, Holly, Fire said, G Boom Holly said they should be five. And number seven, <laughs> South Carolina State Bulldogs sitting at five and six, three and two. Uh, interesting. Everybody is fascinating to see what that looks like. Their first game is on the road in Tallahassee to FAMU. Uh, so that will get interesting real fast. And number six, Morgan State Bears sitting at four and six. And number five, Alabama State Hornets, seven and four, five and three. And number four, Howard Bison, six and six. And number three, Jackson State Tigers, seven and four. Number two, Florida AM and Rattlers, 12 and one. So that is saying a two versus 13 in the MEAC SWAC challenge. And number one is North Carolina Central Eagles, nine and three. So in the Orange Blossom Classic, you have a five versus one matchup in week number one. Uh, it should be fascinating when we get all this. As we said, we'll close this chapter, come back on the other side, give you a little insight from T.C. Taylor. Then we'll get a little time to talk a little bit more about some of my concerns and get your concerns in terms of the decision made by the interim president under the guidance of the board of trustees at Florida a &M University. Will this affect athletics? Will it affect particularly the football team? But you also got volleyball. It'll be fascinating to see what that looks like as we come back on the other side and get my thoughts and you all's thoughts based on my thoughts in terms of how we move forward after we watch the T.C. Taylor video. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. 
Choice Hotels is a family of brands that helps you get the most for your money so you can be any traveler you want to be. You could be a free hot breakfast hero in a comfort hotel. Yes! That's how you waffle! Mr. This Script got a plot twist at a Radisson Hotel. A business big leaguer. Go for key. Even the ultimate pool float inflator. With 22 brands and the best value for your money, Choice Hotels has a stay for any you. Book direct at choicehotels.com, where travels come true. Got to get the corners. Atlanta, Georgia. The HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Miak Swag Challenge on August 24th. Florida A&M Rattlers, Norfolk State Spartans. Swag versus Miak. The rivalry is real. Come out to Center Park Stadium to see the returning HBCU national champions and two of the best HBCU bands in the land, the Marching 100 and the Spartan Legion. The day starts with a kickoff fan experience tailgate and concludes with a primetime matchup on A. BC. For more information, visit MeXWackChallenge.com. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonia sent you. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. And with that being said, let's get in here and play the TC Taylor video from his press conference at this point here. Coach, you talked about your quarterbacks, but what are the what is the running backs room looking like? Uh, pick one. You know, you can basically pick one, but uh, we got uh, a freshman over there that's looking really good. Travis Terrell out of Georgia is going to be a special, special player. You still got Irv coming back. You still got J.D. Martin back out there. Uh, Ahmaud Miller is still here. You know, uh, Desmond Moultrie is still here. Nate Blunt, a local kid from Brandon, is having a great camp. There's just so many of them up over there that can run the football, but all of them kind of bring something a little different to the table. But, you know, a great group of uh, players right there. Uh, speak, speaking of that, what's... This is Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Lab. You got a little something out of there. You got a, a freshman running back, man. How, how y'all doing what y'all do on these sidelines, asking and getting these coaches to tell all the stories on <laughs> camp. Good stuff. We'll think good information there. Talk a little bit about your, your thoughts in terms of what's going on with Jackson in their camp and what you got out of that uh, press conference there. I think the biggest thing I took away from the press conference was his emphasis on making sure the the offensive line and defensive line are strong this season. And it kind of goes back to Charles' point of like, you know, depending on – how the quarterback play is, but we all know that the quarterback play is contingent upon what that offensive line looks like. And in years, it's at certain times, even just going back to when Shadora Sanders was a quarterback, we saw how many times at times he had to run for his life at times. So we're going to have to see, or we're going to be looking to see how strong that offensive line is going to look. That's going to allow if Jacoby and Morgan or whoever the starter is going to be, but we'll say for now, if it is Jacoby and Will he be able to sit in the pocket, make passes? I mean, obviously, we've seen him be able to move around and, and get the ball downfield. He has a strong arm. We've seen him make, you know, those longer passes down the field. Uh, but he didn't necessarily have that full season last year. Now he's going to have a full season. Now he's going to be required to put the ball down, uh, bring the, you know, be able to throw the ball downfield to be able to open up that running game. Um, so I think the biggest emphasis that 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 Coach Taylor was really just really emphasizing was the offensive, defensive line, and special teams. Uh, I can tell you for sure, he will never go into another game without a punter <laughs> or a kicker. He will <laughs> probably, probably every press conference, he's going to emphasize we got to have a kicker. We have to have a healthy kicker and a healthy, punt, he healthy punter at all times. He will never be like that again. 
<laughs> I can understand why. And uh, great points you make there. Let's turn the page a little bit. Uh, we got some insight about camps going on. Uh, went all the way from Houston to Jackson. And that's Houston, Texas to Jackson, Mississippi for some great insight in terms of what's going on uh, throughout SWAC camps. And we'll get some more insight from other uh, coaches as we kind of close things out as we get prepared. Uh, but the big news of the day, uh, FAMU interim president, Dr. Timothy Beard, uh, asked his leadership team, uh, resignations from the HBCU um, game day, uh, provided this updates. And when I first heard uh, the messages coming out, and I was like, the entire leadership team? And for me, I was like, that's, I have never seen anything like that. Um, and I talk about the business side as well in terms of large companies, Fortune 500 companies. I can't recall a time when you talked about the entire leadership team from a institution or company uh, being asked uh, to resign or being summarily fired, essentially, and pushed out. So it'll be fascinating to kind of see what this looks like. Uh, there's some updates that says that he may actually interview some of these folks in terms of keeping them in their place. Uh, that would be intriguing to find out that there would be some continuity as you get into the academic year. Uh, classes at FAMU start on August 26th. Uh, to give you some updates in terms of what that looks like, obviously, uh, early registration was back in April. Um, so you got that in the books, but people are coming back as they get ready to get into housing. Um, July 1st, residency fees, classification type things will come in. The residency hall opens first thing August the 19th in terms of folks moving in place when they can get in there. Obviously, camp is gone, so your athletic programs in terms of volleyball and football for FAMU, they do not have women's soccer, so you don't have to worry about that early season getting going. They're there. They're in place moving forward. Um, they ask uh, the number two uh, to move up in terms of Robinson, who has been uh, the athletic director or interim uh, position before, so that's going to be intriguing to see him be able to at least hit the ground running, I think, a little bit because he's familiar with a lot of operations stuff. Uh, but still, that means somebody has to backfield the work that he's responsible for. Mm -hmm. uh, I put this out there in our personal chain that I'm not sure if people understand that. But based on what came out, you're talking about the chief operating officer. That's basically your CFO in a lot of areas in terms of your financial component of the university. Who are you back feeding to talk about who's going to lead that? So that means all your financial stuff in terms of your travel from your teams, that needs to place. So that's going to be fascinating to kind of see what that looks like. The provost's office, my understanding, when you talk about the leadership team, that's over all your professors, all your research, all your grant, who's going to backfill that information. Uh, that's part of your academics in regards to uh, making sure the eligibility piece from an academic perspective, not only including athletics, uh, but your retention and all those kind of things. It's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. Your general counsel, that is your legal folks that review your contracts, uh, not just from an athletics perspective, uh, but in terms of the institution university. So who's going to backfill that role? Um, and who's going to backfill the person that you fill in in that? Because you hadn't hired somebody new. Now, maybe he has a way that he's going to do uh, hires pretty fast. But what does that mean in terms of the vetting situation? How much knowledge does the number two person have in regards to their role? Are they doing both the number one and the number two role? Who's splitting this up? Who's making that decision? Obviously, athletic director, VP, uh, with a lot of people focus on, has moved on. The chief of staff, that's the person that organizes everything for uh, the president's office. That individual is letting go. Communication of director. All your information that goes out to the information. And they said several other key cabinet position. Uh, VP, I would imagine, uh, of your student affairs, student services. What about your chief of police? Oftentimes your chief of police or security, uh, they're on the president council. Does that include that individual? Who's going to be responsible and backfilling that? Um, 
this was just made. So it'll be interesting to me. Did you call out to the second person in charge to see that they were ready to take the leadership? Did you feel front comfortable with the person that is going to be backfilling these roles? How long is this stuff going to be vacant in terms of the position? Um, if you're talking about the person that's backfilling these roles, um, how much experience do they have uh, in this? So you're talking about a lot of institutional knowledge that you basically just dismiss. So I'm not sure for those that are outside of this that haven't had higher education experience, thought with this meet. A lot of times, obviously, the sensational uh, news point of saying all these changes took place. Is something that you grab onto, and obviously, as sports fans, we look at what this means from Tiffany Don Sykes. So, uh, I should say Michael Smith will be the associate athletic director, he'll be moving up and taking a lot of the responsibilities. Uh, but as the associate, that means he was second in charge, which I imagine that his plate was really full. Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to be doing both positions or getting somebody to backfield, and who is that going to be? as things move forward. So a lot of way I'm concerned uh, in regards to what this looks like um, for an institution. And obviously the president I'm sure is doing his best judgment in terms of Dr. Timothy Beard uh, in terms of experience, but I'm fascinated to see what this looks like. So this is something to keep your eyes on in terms of the long-term track of how institution moves forward. And more importantly, who will ultimately get these roles as a full-time position. I do not like to use the word permanent because as you see, there is no such thing as permanent uh, in the business world out there. Who will get these in full-time capacity moving forward to help Florida A&M University continue to do the good things they've done and move the institution forward. With that being said, I know I put a lot on the table. Uh, Wilton, what are your thoughts in terms of my comments, in terms of maybe giving you a little more insight at the level of what was announced today by the president asking for these resignations? Dr. Kabir, I think you put you put you you summed up everything uh, as a person who is, you know, used to reporting sports, but then also teaches on the collegiate level. All those things matter. And you start talking about not only are these athletes how the way they perform on the field, but like let's just say just these athletes in general, they have they're still students too, and they have to go to classes too. And so beyond that, it's just like to your point of if if everybody's doing somebody else's position and somebody has to back you know backfield somebody else, it's like are we really getting anything done? Or are yeah. we just trying to keep things afloat? And what we do know is is that you know there's something called controlled chaos, but in this case, it's not control. I mean, because everybody's doing something that either they were doing previously, but now they're adding something else to it. And so you're doing something that maybe you don't necessarily know all the rest of the details on how to do it. And you're literally doing it on the fly. And so it's like when you have to do that, which a lot of times different businesses, not even just with higher education, but different businesses, you see that people do that all the time. But sometimes, actually, oftentimes you'll see mistakes. Now, how those mistakes are covered that depends on the business and what type of leader you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so how they, how they navigate mm. that the president yeah. does in charge, how, how, how they navigate that, that rotation of things with a very short time span to do it. Um, it's going to be, in, it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. So uh, in terms of those thoughts, good points made Wilton Jackson and the Second, and I'm glad you put them to the table because that's what I wanted to kind of showcase. Charles, any additional points that you wanted to kind of put out there based on uh, what I put on the table to give a little more insight in terms of the depth of how this covers the institution uh, in a lot of different ways? Well, I think you, both of you all hit on some very good points. And I think, unfortunately, it's inevitable when you have a, a domino effect. And, I, and I've been part of this in my prior corporate environment where uh, you had a huge change in, in terms of senior leadership, mm -hmm. uh, it, the inevitability that something will slip through the cracks. Uh, the good fortune that, that I will say that I, I was able to watch was the approach was different. It was a phased, more phased approach in terms of changing out some of the positions within senior leadership. And it took over the course of a year for some of those positions uh, to to have changed. So uh, and even, even with that, uh, the inevitability that there was uh, more pressure 
quote unquote going downstream uh, on on every business unit uh, uh, from what I was able to see. And uh, you know, I, the hope at least is that uh, Florida A and M is able to sort of survive this, as you put it, uh, this this control chaos, Wilton, uh, to the best of their ability. But uh, it's very tough when you when you're talking about. So many positions affected. Somebody has to backfield something else. Somebody has to backfield something else. And overall, you know, how does it affect the customer service of the student? That's the that's the most important thing. Great point. When you talk about the customer service of the students and, and all other folks, particularly when you get into athletics, now you're talking about your alumni engagement. And I'm sure, you know, many people had their concerns of what took place at FAMU and uh, to some degree, I'm sure this is obviously a fallout, but fascinating to see what that looks like. The last thing I'll say there is obviously uh, when you look at athletics, since we're a sports show, uh, the AD Tiffany Sykes had a three year contract. I believe it ended in December of 25. So I'd be surprised if she submitted a resignation. Um, she probably was obviously given a paper because if you submit the resignation, what does that do to the contract in terms of boiling it out uh, versus being dismissed, meaning that they uh, are responsible f for paying the remainder of the contract, or at least if they choose not to, then you have legal grounds to seek for your money. So that's another thing because now you're adding additional cost on top of uh, this decision it made because obviously with Mike stepping up, now you have to supplement his salary to some degree in terms of the added uh, responsibilities as acting as the AD uh, in uh, this uh, period of time. And then you got to do a search, and you got to do a search for all these positions. As a state institution, obviously, you can put somebody in as interim or acting, uh, but at some point when you want to do a full-time position, all these have to have a search in the process in terms of the last person and how long will that take? So how long will these people be in these interim and acting roles or something to keep your eyes on as well? With that being said, thank you for your time. A lot of good dialogue, great uh, information out there in terms of the HBC landscape. And it continues uh, to churn like nothing else as we get into hopefully getting some news of what's going to take place on the playing surface. Thank you for listening of Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from Inside the Lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Uh, again, I want to thank Wilton Jackson II coming on here and giving us some great insight. Look forward as we continue to negotiate. Um, I guess you're trying to look for that three year contract as well. Um, <laughs> you know what? You could just make, you could just give me six months, and we'll we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Well, I was just trying to go month to month, you know, week to week. But man, these six months, three years, it's tough. Again, we <laughs> thank you for listening inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Wash and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back on Thursday as we give you the. Unveil of the top seven of the mid-major division. These gentlemen will be out doing their things on assignment. So we'll bring two more group back in. As we said last Thursday, we had fun. So we're going to try to bring AD back in and uh, give some updates to see if we can get Stephen Gaither as well as his stuff kind of went viral as he upset the apple cart last week. We'll see what he has to say, maybe bringing him back in uh, in terms of what that looks like. See if we can get Mike out of the uh, his working assignment and get him on a little bit as well. We'll see what that looks like. Can't promise you. But Mike is always on assignment. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Caville. That's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, B-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Even though I hadn't been much on Twitter as of late, but we'll see if you can get you that information to keep it going. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 is on Twitter. Facebook, and YouTube inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We'll talk with you soon. With that being said, Wilton, you've been doing this pretty good. Let's see if you can keep that going. Charles? Of course. Lecture. Wilton? Dismiss. He got it, man. Let's, oh, man. We work on that little three-week three, three contract. <laughs> Let's see what we